to um, take care of the Dutch ovens, how to use them. Um, I picked a couple of fairly simple but really yummy recipes today uh, so that uh, we can have a great time. Um, I've got a couple of um, I've got some coals here warming up and a Dutch oven here that's almost ready for sautéing. Yeah, it needs to be a little warmer there. Um, let's take a moment. If you look at the uh, the handout, the first thing I put up there was some of the tools to go along with uh, Dutch oven cooking. Some of these are really important to have, and some of them are just very nice to have. Thought I'd talk about that while the uh, Dutch oven's heating up here a little bit. Um, first one is kind of obvious, it's the Dutch oven. Um, most of the ones, in fact all the ones I use are cast iron. Uh, you can also get them in aluminum. Aluminum heats differently than cast iron, but it's a lot lighter. Uh, aluminum also does not need to have the black coating on it, which is very important for cast iron because cast iron rusts. I mean, you can get a little bit wet, and you can actually watch it rust. It's that quick. And uh, <clears throat> the, the black coating over time, as more and more of it adds, and it's made by oils that are that are actually caramelized and, and then carbonized onto the iron, it becomes a nonstick coating, and as nice as Teflon, without the toxicity. It's really cool. Um, why don't you go ahead and get the bag of veggies out? Because um, it's looking like this will probably be ready to saute here in a few minutes. I've got a little bit of olive oil here in the bottom just heating up. Um, and then last night we, we chopped up a bunch of vegetables. Um, we've got onions, garlic, uh, and then some various colors of peppers. I, when I do chili, I like to do different colors. I found out recently, by the way, that the different colors of chili are not different kinds of peppers. They're just more ripe. I didn't know that. But I like to use the different colors because, you know, they taste good and it gives it more, more color and more variety. I want you to go ahead and drop those in. Um... So the Dutch oven is one very important tool. Um, the lid lifter, very important because, of course, you don't want to be handling a, a scalding hot um, cast iron lid yourself with your hands, right? Um, these are This particular brand is really cool because it locks together like that and that keeps it from tipping and dropping ash into your food. Like mine does. <laughs> Where can you buy the lifter? Any, any place you can also get Dutch ovens will typically have some kind of lifters. Um, you can get them at like uh, Cabela's, Sportsman's Warehouses, all of those Our kinds of places. Is there, is there a favorite type of Dutch oven, like the Lodge or the whatever? I mean, you know, that's different a, names. That's an interesting and a very good question, actually, that I get asked a lot. And I wish certain companies would pay me money to endorse them. <laughs> but realistically, no. Um, 
Yes and no, I should say. Um, because when, when I look at Dutch ovens, I, I look at them and I realize that my pioneer ancestors crossed the plains with ones that were probably not nearly as well cast as the ones we have today. And so there are some that are better quality, but really you can still cook great dishes in, in just about anything that works. One thing that I find very common among some of the cheaper Dutch ovens is that the lids don't sit quite as well. So for example, these ones are both Lodge as a company. I really like Lodge, but they're also a lot more money. Um, so some of these others, if you press around the edge, you'll find a point where the lid will actually rock because it's not seating very well. And that does mean that some moisture can get out. Again, that's not the end of the world. You can still cook great meals in them, but it, it doesn't seal as tight. The, the beauty of the Dutch oven really is that this heavy lid traps the moisture and essentially steams the food while you're also cooking it in, with other kinds of like radiant heat and things like that. So that's one common thing is that, see this one's pretty stable. Store that you prefer to buy Dutch ovens, or where they sell them? No, there's some um, in uh, on Redwood up about 41st or so. Actually, I think it's more like between 41st and 47th. There's an Army Navy surplus store that carries them. Okay. They've actually got quite a wide range of stock of different qualities. See if some of those coals there are enough to replenish down underneath. I'm sure there are. Yeah. Jake's got a question. What kind of cool, what kind of cool, cools do you, what, what brand do you like to use? Yeah. That's something I am very picky about. Thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> I use basic, typical Kingsfords, okay? Different coals will have different, what I call, burning curves. Some get hot very quickly and then cool off suddenly. Some get hot gradually and then spike. Some, And if you're used to and accustomed to a brand and you're accustomed to that burning curve, you can make whatever work for you. Kingsford's heat up pretty quickly and, and burn down steadily, so I really like them. Um, I've actually ruined dishes before because I was using a brand that I wasn't used to. And that's really frustrating. So, people call me a, a bit of a coal snob, but I will use ordinary Kingsford's. And don't worry about things like mesquite or chips built into the charcoal or, or anything like that because the smoke's not going to get into your food anyway through the cast iron. Um, Kingsford also makes what they call match lights, which are already infused with um, lighter fluid. Those burn quicker and they burn out quicker. And again, if you're used to that, fine, but I like them longer burning and more steady. Thanks, Jake. You notice Brendan using the, uh, the charcoal tongs? If you're going to use tongs, Make sure if you're going to use tongs, make sure that you have one tongue, one set of tongs set aside for the coals, and then another one for food because these things will never get clean. Yeah, <laughs> they get all kinds of all kinds of nasty toxic chemicals on them. <clears throat> yeah, that's finally starting to warm up a bit. <laughs> I was, a, I was a bit of an idiot this morning. I had these two big, huge bags. You can buy the, the Kingsford and, and dual bag bundles. And I bought some last night, and I put them in my truck ready to go so I wouldn't forget them, and I drove the van. <laughs> so I had to run down to Smith's and buy a bag, and so we're... That time was that I had originally planned on heating up the charcoal was spent chasing the charcoal. Okay. 
Uh, the lemons are going to go on at the very end. Um, let's see. Show them the chimney. So this is the chimney. It's attacking me. <laughs> um, basically, it's a tall cylinder metal thing. has a hole on top. Um, I like this particular kind because it also has holes on the sides. Which allow some, which uh, allow for some ventilation, and it'll. I found that the uh, the coals turn white more evenly and more quickly with ventilation up the sides. I've seen some that don't have the holes up the sides. I mean, it's, it, they still all work, so it's not like. I we have a friend who has a homemade chimney. He made with a couple of coffee cans. Yeah. Not sure. It, it works. I like this one much better, but it works. Oh, my favorite thing about this, I'm not the strongest person in the world. And so when it comes to shaking the coals, it's tricky to do with one hand. But I like how it has a handle because I can then use both hands, whereas there's not enough room on this handle for only one. I think that one's made by Weber. Um, you need some kind of cooking surface. In fact, I was talking, what was your name again? Kathy. Kathy. I was talking to Kathy about this a little bit ago. Um, when I first started Dutch oven cooking, I just had a couple of one foot by two foot brick paver stones that I put my coals on and my Dutch ovens on. So it was like this, um, only on the ground. And uh, that worked fine. Um, I was told at the time that a lot of the heat from the coals was being absorbed into the brick. So I got this low table down here. And um, I noticed a little difference, but not a really significant one. And then my wife got me this upright table. So you don't have to bend over? So I don't have to bend over, <laughs> which is pretty nice. Very sturdy. This is made by Camp Chef. It's like 80 bucks. Will you explain how you started the coals? Because don't you have to put, like, newspaper under, like, take us through the process. I use, uh, I use lighter fluid. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and, I've never been able to get these things to light with newspaper. I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know you could do that. And um, one thing I have learned, is, for me, the newspaper burns out before the coals get lit. But I have learned that if you soak the newspaper in... Your cooking oil, it'll burn a little longer. And then all you would do is you take it and set it underneath here. And then just set it back on top, light it, and then it'll uh, catch well, these. Well, once, actually, for a cook-off, I actually made a Dutch oven cook-off, and I actually made brownies in there. Brownies? Yeah, in the, in the Dutch oven. Yes? If you're not going to buy the table or that little stand and you're just going to do it on the ground, like on cement, can you put it? Can you put aluminum foil down so it doesn't burn up your cement? Yeah, there's an interesting question there, too. Um, in most cases, you're not going to harm your cement. Okay? Um, it might crack, wouldn't it crack it getting hot or it doesn't get that hot? No, but it turns it black. It can turn it black. Um, I did some research into that. Um, what happens is um, cement doesn't conduct heat really well. So when it gets really hot, then it expands on the surface, but down below it, it does not expand. And that's what can cause it to crack. So if you're doing it in the same place daily, you could probably get some cracking. On the other hand, if you do once a week, once a month, you're probably not going to get significantly hot enough so that you get the expansion and contraction that's going to make it crack. However, it's a lot easier to clean up with aluminum foil. So you can just put aluminum foil. What if you, can you just do it on dirt? Yes. The one thing you don't want to do, though, is put it on soft dirt because then the, um, the lights will sink into the dirt and it'll end up resting right on the coals and then you'll get hot spots. Oh, okay. So if you've got like some hard packed ground, sure. Okay. And don't do it on grass. 
Oh. No, yeah. You won't have crafts very long. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I would just stack it in a pyramid. And then what you can do is you can kind of take the tongues and flatten the pyramid and restack it every once in a while to, to kind of mix it. In fact, I'm going to have to mix that one a little bit because we need to get some down at the bottom. And what are you waiting for? Like, what constitutes a good one? What constitutes a bad one? That's about what I would put on. White around the edges, mostly white, because that's going to burn um, for, for quite a while. Charcoal Dar doesn't catch on fire, uh, for the most part. I have seen some small fires in there occasionally, but it doesn't really catch. Instead, it just whitens. On the outside, like he's saying, it becomes ash. So, are those ones that are white almost gone? These ones? Yeah. Because no. that's how I thought was ready. Yeah. <laughs> see, to me, that's... I've already lost a lot of time uh, on that one. No wonder. <laughs> so... So, you kind of rotate them around to get the ones in the uh, middle. And, and that's what you want to get Yes, that'll help a lot because the ash actually insulates. What was the question? Uh, um, if you tap on the coals that are white, it'll knock the ash off. Yeah. And it'll stop that insulation that the ash is doing. Like there's one that's really white. There are times when, yeah, there are times when I can, I've been burning for a while, I'll just go around and I'll tap it and I can actually feel the difference. So you just want to leave the coals alone? Pretty much. And is it, how many do you put? Like if it's a 12 inch, you put 12 inch. That's a good question. And that's actually on the handout. If it's, oh, okay, I had read that Oven part. size, temperature, and then the amount of pulls. Now, I want to kind of explain the, uh, the, um, the chart there is, it'll, it'll show the oven size, the basic temperature, and the number of coals. And the chart's also in the books. Um, there's a range of coals there, if you'll notice. And you also notice it doesn't say where to put them. We'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. But if you're in a nice, hot, sunny day, you can use the lower number. If it's a cold, windy, breezy, rainy day, use the higher number. The more wind that comes through, it knocks the ash off, and then the coals die out faster. And so there's a lot less heat. Uh -huh. And uh, if you're, depending on what kind of cooking method you use, depend, determines which, how many coals you put on the bottom and how many coals you put on the top. Um, right now we're kind of browning and sauteing. Now we're finally getting some, some action going on here. Don't mess with that one. Yeah. And so everything's on the bottom. Okay, now if we're doing a, a long roast, I'm going to do about half the coals on the bottom and half the coals on the top. Maybe a few extra on top because heat rises. But I'm going to split it pretty evenly between top and bottom. If I'm, um, and this is kind of misleading, but if I'm baking, I'm going to put a third on the bottom and two thirds on top. Now, there's a lot of dishes that I do where I'm using that baking technique that you don't normally think of as baking, like doing chicken and potatoes or a gratin potatoes or a lot of different kinds of dishes. Mountain man breakfast. Mountain man breakfast, where you don't think, oh, I'm baking a cake or I'm baking bread. But it's still the same basic technique, in which case I'll still have a third on the bottom and a third on top. Yeah? Before you get too far, could you tell us uh, what your uh, favorite technique for seasoning a new oven would be? That's another great point. Um, yeah, I will get some more there. We're finally getting some things going. I'm going to get the, the meat browning. Um, I like to do it outside on my charcoal grill, or not charcoal grill, my gas grill, because it can get pretty smoky. 
but you can do it inside. You want to get it pretty hot, like around 400, 450. And um, I'm going to shout a minute because I need to kind of demonstrate. But I'll set the Dutch oven in the grill, face down like that. After rubbing oil in it. Actually, what I usually do first is get it hot. Is just get it hot. Right, and then like that. Then I'll take it out, obviously wearing gloves, and I'll coat it. And I use Crisco to coat it. Although you can use just about any oil. It's just very easy to handle the Crisco, and it melts on really fast. Then I put it back in. And I bake it again for about another 20 minutes. And you can really actually do that two or three times. Or even more, actually. There's not really a maximum limit. But usually I find after a couple of times it's nice and black and it's ready to go. That also can be done if you have to re-season an old oven. That got rusty or something. Sorry? That got rusty or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you've got a rusted iron, take a, a metal scouring pad to it and a little bit of elbow grease and get the rust off. And there's all kinds of chemical processes you can use to get the rust off, including diacola. So do you, do you put... Always makes me a bit nervous. Do you just season it on the cooking surfaces or do you, do you season the... Light? I season it all around. Yeah. And when I'm done... Each time I also recoat all around, even the outside. So when you first put it in your grill to get it hot, how long do you leave it in there? 15, 20 minutes. Uh, what about cleaning after you're done? Uh, do you just kind of wipe it out? Do you ever yeah, actually, it depends on where I am. If I'm, like, I do a lot of my cooking on my back porch. Um, so what I do is I just take it over to my kitchen sink and use the sprayer and spray it out. That gets almost everything out. I have these little plastic squares that I use to, to scrape with. Um, those are pretty popular in, in a lot of the little cooking stores these days. Um, so that gets, if you, if you cooked with something sweet, which caramelizes to the edge, or cheese, those things can be pretty hard to get off sometimes. So that scrapes it off. But even those don't stick very much. And then just rinse it, and then if you have to do any scrubbing just with a, a plastic bristle brush, I find does really well. Uh, soap actually takes off the season that we've just went over, and so using the soap will actually take off this black season. The, black coating. the coating. Patina. Patina. I always forget that name. Patina, what is it? Can you tell us, what is patina? That's the coating, the black, the black coating. The black carbonized coating. So carbonization. It was always so funny. It's such a sweet sounding name for burnt oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put about half the meat in there. Yeah. Okay, any other questions up to the moment? Yeah. With the new pan, how many times do you have to season it before it? Once or twice. No. Yeah, if you get a really good coating of oil and season it once, then once, twice, three times, that'll be fine in, the, in that one cycle. And then every time you use it, you give it another thin coat, so the next time you bake or cook with it, it gets... Oh, nice shot. <laughs> <laughs> That was close. <laughs> <laughs> Lost to me. So are you saying that once you use it, you put a coat of oil on it and then do the process again, or just to store it? Just well, when I, and, and this is, since I use my Dutch ovens a lot, um, when I'm done with it, I've cleaned it, I've dried it, I'll give it a really thin coating, and really thin, not so that you can even... <laughs> So it's just a little shiny, you know, not so that it's puddling up in it or so you can see it on your fingers or anything like just a very thin coating. And then the next time that I use it, it's going to bake that layer on as well. 
And so that layer, it, other people will coat it right before they use it and heat it before they use it. Um, the one problem with coating it right before you put it away is if it's six months before you use it again, it's rancid. Yeah. then the oil can go rancid. So. Do you ever use liner? Right. A paper towel inside it will also help um, soak up some of the moisture that happens to be kind of trapped in the air. And then if you put a, a paper towel draped out, that also helps wick the moisture out. It also helps um, allow air in, and that's less likely to, to go bad that way. Again, that is for, like, more long-term storage, though. Uh, like my dad said, he uses this about once a week. Maybe once every two weeks at the latest. And so storing it like that, it's not going to go yeah. rancid or anything like that. Because we're just constantly heating it up, constantly using it. People will often ask me, how do I winterize my Dutch ovens? And I say, I just keep using them. <laughs> <laughs> and there's really no way to winterize them. You just... You know, make sure that they're relatively dry, because oil doesn't really fully dry, right? Just make sure that it's not sopping in oil and, and just store it in a dry place. Coconut oil tends to not go rancid as quickly, so maybe... That's what I've heard, that. yes. What yeah, is that? Coconut oil. Oh, I knew that. It also um, spreads like Crisco, so you right. can use it. Okay. Yeah, we actually use that in our popcorn maker. Oh, me too. It's good. <laughs> the only thing you have to list off is a lid stand. That's true. And we have one down here. And, and it's a great thing to have, very convenient, um, so that you can set the lid down on the ground without having it get actually on the ground, which is very convenient. Um, it's also convenient for other things. Um, for example, turn that... Turn that upside down, oh, yes. the lid upside down. You put coals underneath that, you can use it as a griddle. And I've actually made crepes on it like this. So, and that's good for pancakes, tortillas, anything like that as well. Eggs, bacon. Eggs, yes, all that stuff. But his, his crepes were by far the most impressive of all those things I've listed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One time, um, and this is on the blog actually, marksblackpot.com, I used my lid to do a, a stack of pancakes, which I layered with a very, very thin layer of frosting, or blueberry pancakes, thin layer of, of uh, cake frosting, Cream and then cheese. frosted the top, and the whole thing was like a cake, and we sliced it like a cake and served it up oh, like a cake. It was, it was delicious. Good. Cream cheese icing. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, so how often do you cook dinner? Like you cook dinner every night? Uh, no, no, I do our Sunday dinners. Oh, right. That's actually that. how this all got started. Is um, in fact, this is the actual Dutch oven that my wife bought me uh, one Father's Day about eight years ago, and um, I can tell because it has the chip in the lid. I don't know how that happened, but suddenly uh, I think it got pulled too quick and chipped out the lid. And uh, okay, we're about ready to start adding some more ingredients and start making this a real chili here. Please, buddy. Okay. Go ahead and add the beans and the uh, chicken stock. Oh, I didn't know. Before I, I was telling the story, um, so I started cooking my our family Sunday dinners on the back porch. First thing I did was pizza, and, and it was just started becoming a family tradition that I would cook our family dinners. And I started looking for more and more ideas and recipes and things to cook, and it just started getting more and more fun. And then I started blogging about it. And that was my mistake. <laughs> but actually, then the publisher found my blog. And said, "Well, let's do a um, do some cookbooks." And so that's how I'm now rich and famous. <laughs> if you're rich and famous, you buy me more stuff. 
<laughs> okay, question. Yeah? You ever use a propane stove? I have. I'm kind of a purist kind of guy, so I really like the coals. There are some things, however, that you just can't do with coals because it just does not get hot enough. Like, uh, like deep frying. It's very, very difficult to get uh, a Dutch oven hot enough to do. What's um, that? What is this? Chicken stock. It's actually chicken. You have to open up the bags that are inside. Yeah, I know. Okay. But there's a whole bunch of liquid. Uh, oh, chicken stock that I take out. When I, whenever I do our, our Thanksgiving and Christmas and family turkeys, I always take the, the carcass afterwards and make stock out of it. So this is actually homemade stock. Chicken stock. Yeah. Put it on some coals and heat it up, and just caramelize it right on there, because it's you know that'll that'll kill off anything. It'll it'll bake on the the oil, and then you just start over again. It's really really tough to damage a Dutch oven. Sometimes people will, you know say, this thing is all rusted and dirty, I'll just throw it away. No. No, you can fix it and look at it'll be just as if it were brand new. Do you soak your beans or do you... Yes, yes, I wanted to mention that too. In fact, I'm going to put the lid on here so we can... Yes, these... Because this is a um, preparedness event, I was trying to make this you know, we do have some fresh ingredients here, but I was trying to make this as much as possible um, ingredients from... Yeah, these turned to look really nice. In, um, ingredients that are likely to be found in food storage as much as possible. Yeah, actually... And um, where was I? What was I talking about? Soaking beans, yes. And so the, the beans were um, just dried bagged beans, you know, which keep, you know, forever basically, right? Especially if you put them in like the, the cans or the mylar, right? And uh, so I, um, overnight I soaked them. You'll notice there were some different colors of the beans. That's just another one of my personal days. I like to eat with my eyes, too. And so I, I pick black beans, pinto beans, and kidney beans. Always, the, the beauty of chili is you cook with what you've got, right? But I really like to, to mix it up with the different colored peppers and their different colored beans because then it really... It looks a lot more interesting. And if you've got them, use them, right? Yes? Do you press the pre-seasoning when you buy a Dutch oven, or do you still season it yourself because you're like, you're not sure? Um, I've usually trusted them. Okay. One of the things I actually like about pre-season, and almost all of the big brands these days come pre-seasoned. Camp Chef, Lodge, all of them pretty much come pre-season now. Um, one thing I do like about the big name brands that do the pre-seasoning is that it's nice and even, and it's really well baked on. And um, eventually it will probably need to be re-seasoned, but when it comes off the store, I like that, that it's, it's well done. Some of the off-brands or some of the Chinese brands, Ah, yes. I actually remembered the candle panel this time. Last time we had run into a store, middle of demo, <laughs> buy a can opener. I don't forget things. <laughs> like the coals. <laughs> That's what he has you for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Please, if anyone's going to remember something, it's him. Oh, yeah, he's, he's good at that. Well, there you go. What what sizes do you like to use for Dutch ovens? What sizes of Dutch ovens? That um yes. 
The 12 inch is my workhorse. Um, that'll feed a family of four with a little bit of leftovers. And that depends a little bit on what you're cooking. Chili, obviously you can fill that up to the brim and it'll feed a lot more. Um, but you can, um, you can roast a chicken in it. You can, um, you can do a, a small uh, roast beef in it. There's just so much you can do in a 12 inch. That's become my workhorse. That's a 12 inch shallow. There's also one that's about two inches taller. That's a 12 inch deep. Um, the 10 inch I really like for cakes, and we're going to do a bread in it here in a minute. In fact, we probably ought to get started on that. Um, and then um, one time, Brendan, for my birthday, chose a uh, an 8 inch for me. And it's a tiny little thing. And I thought, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's really nice. I'll never use it. But it's so cute. And I use it a lot for sauces, for rice. Who's laughing now? I'm not laughing. Well, actually, I'm still laughing, but I'm laughing in a fun way because it's really good. Yeah, um, not very often. Um, because um, you have to be using the right kind of, the heat is a little more delicate when you're stacking them because if you're doing something that normally requires a third of the heat below and a third of the heat above, two thirds, or two thirds above, thank you, and you put a Dutch oven on top of that, then suddenly you've got the equivalent of two thirds of the heat below. And then, and so usually when I do that, I'll do half and half and half and half and half and half, depending on how high I'm stacking, and I'll just watch it very carefully to make sure it doesn't burn. Yeah, the tricky part is that that means you'll have a lot more heat on the bottom, and when I'm baking, I like to have a lot more heat on the top because they are very likely to burn the bottom. So you do have to be careful with that. But it's still possible. Um, I'm usually just kind of cooking for my family, and so I'm not dealing with that kind of quantity. There have been times when I've been cooking for larger groups when stacking is is the way to go. Yeah, when you're doing like a family reunion, you do just want to watch the, uh, the heat. And you, I would split the coals evenly rather than try and do the one-third, two-thirds. But then if you're doing baking, then you have to watch it even more carefully so you don't burn the bottom of whatever it is you're baking. Well, I'm going to have him hold the mic for a minute. Hi. I'm going to direct your attention to the... Uh, the uh, soda bread recipe. I'm going to get started on that. First thing we're going to do, actually, on that. You know, actually, chili, I'm going to do all on the bottom all the time. Because I'm really just doing simmering. So, I'm, I'm just keeping the lid on it so that it heats up quicker and it cooks better. But I'm not... No. I've, I've actually done it. And I've not really noticed a significant difference. Now, this one we're going to, sorry, Brendan. <laughs> we're actually going to get this very hot and we're going to preheat it. We're going to put a lot of coals there on top. Okay. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's about right, actually. Twenty-one. Yeah. I can see. So leave that one on. Toss that one back. Now it's twenty. <laughs> and then we want to get out. Ouch. Hot chimney, huh? Yeah, hot chimney. You were the top. 
mean, it's like, I think it's tough to hold a hand that high off. Hmm. <laughs> what do you think? Cold chimney, cold hot cold. You know, it might be a little warm. <laughs> Just say it. How many degrees per cold? About 20, right? Well, I'm, I'm not how. really sure it's linear. But I've heard people say about 25 degrees per coal. Um, Depending on how well warmed it is or the weather outside or whatever you're... It depends on a lot of factors. I should say that. So when you do this, by the way, I strongly recommend the first few times you do this to get accustomed to how that feels. Um, because after several times of doing that, you start to identify, okay, yeah, that's hot enough. Or that's not hot enough. I need to replenish the coals. Or that's too hot. Or yeah, or... <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brendan. Yep. <laughs> Let's get out a couple of cups of flour. Okay. Is there a trick on spacing the coals on the top or the bottom? So Evenly. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, this is the flour, right? Yeah. yeah. You want to do it around the edge, either underneath or around the edge, and only fill in the center as you run out of space, I guess is what I'm saying. Where I'm, what happens is... One. <laughs> See, I can count. Anybody want to take him home? <laughs> no. I will do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, um, the, the heat radiates around the spot where it's sitting, and then all of those coals tend to radiate the heat inward. So, especially on the bottom, that if you have coals in the middle, that can also create hot spots. Now, when you're doing something like a stew or a chili, hot spots are not a big deal because the liquid is going to disperse that. Um, if you're doing breads or a cake, on the other hand, that's a big deal. Because then you'll have a, a burn spot and doughy other spots, right? And so that's why if you set it on a rim, the heat will radiate inward. It'll also radiate up the sides. And... Um, Can I get this? Yes. Do you want garlic salt in that or just plain salt? Is that, that's yeah, that's kosher salt. Oh. One teaspoon. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it actually go just a little light on the salt. Though. I honestly think those aren't They're a salty food. Now, this one here, I'm actually packing them in kind of tight because 20 coals doesn't usually normally fit very well in a 10 inch Dutch oven. So, obviously, I'm kind of coming in in the second ring in the middle. Now, um, when you're roasting, there's some that say that uh, filling a few in in the middle, especially like in a, what they call a checkerboard pattern, the point really is is just to make it even. Yeah. I usually tend to do it more in rings. Um, I, you probably said this before I got here, but is there a good way to long-term storage uh, coals? Coals? Uh-huh. Actually, we haven't talked about that. And just keep them dry. And they'll just last forever. As far as I know, I've not. I don't really have long-term storage of coals because I use them so much. Oh, but yeah, harder to light. Do they? Um, and that's because they absorb <laughs> moisture out of the air. Um, so just keep them as dry as possible. In your garage, is fine. Um, What's that tablespoon for? There's nothing on here with a tablespoon. Oh, I just grabbed it. Well, I actually store uh, my charcoal at the bottom, and I'll put it in a bag, and I'll just put my charcoal in a bag, and then I have five-gallon buckets and steal that. That could have, yeah, which is a similar principle to some of the, the dry foods, too. Mark, will you repeat what he said? He I'm said that um, he stores charcoal in bags in uh, in the five-gallon tubs, he said, yeah, plastic, plastic five-gallon tubs, five -gallon and that keeps them very dry. I just do mine in a 32-gallon 
galvanized <laughs> trash can. I line it with a compactor trash bag, dump eight bags of charcoal in, put the lid on top. That's like a hot meal for like three or four months every day. Yep. So I have six of those. Oh, great. So I've got, yeah. I've got two years worth of food for my or two year, two years worth of uh, fuel to cook What's with. That, ten garbage like a like it's a galvanized trash can, like thirty two gallon. They're like one of the big thirty thirty bags. gallon trash or uh, steel. We have a shed, drums. and I just store them behind the shed in a little row. So, okay, so we've got the dry ingredients here. Sorry, we've got the dry ingredients here now. Um, the uh, the uh, buttermilk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do a little bit of seasoning on our chili here. No, that's a whole quart. Measure with a little salt. I guess Then you're having some tomorrow for Sunday and then we'll come back and we'll do it. Just every holiday, Labor Day, Memorial Day. Oh, this will be in our spread for a couple of months. Oh, good idea. You can always drink it. Oh, yeah. It's probably good for you. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Did you this, say you put a way, liner on it? It's homemade chili powder. That's right I'm kind of proud of it. I took um, Anaheim, Serrano, and Jalapeno chilies and just set them up and let them dry for a couple of weeks. And then with one of those magic bullet grinders. Don't look directly into that when you open it, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, say the three ones again, the three. Anaheim, Serrano, and Jalapeno. Oh, okay. yeah. And I do those because they have slightly different flavors and because they have slightly different amounts of heat. Anima Anaheim's are pretty mild. Um, <laughs> Serrano's are, are really hot. And Jalapeno's are kind of in the middle. I made some actually just with, with Serrano's once, and that was just like, <laughs> I've had to learn to mild that down, because a little bit of that, ha! Ah! <laughs> this stuff's really good, though. So we can put that bit back on. The um, the next book that's coming out in September is all about breads. I spent quite a long time, several years in fact, trying to trying to perfect my yeast breads. I love it when you start talking about this because I can get a whole bunch of mileage out of this. His first Irish soda bread is a good example. Hockey puck. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more like a doorstop, but <laughs> it was. Uh... It was pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, some of my yeast breads turned out similarly too. Actually. So maybe now's a good time to go over like the cookbooks that we do have and what each one yeah, kind of specializes. One? You want me to start? Do you want me to start with that? Sure. Well, you're needing that. Well, you actually don't need it. I'm just kind of cutting it a little bit. A quick bread like this, you don't want to knead. Slice the 
Traditionally, they slice a cross in the top. There's all kinds of speculation why they do that. Mainly, it's just to vent the steam, make it easier to crack. So the three books that we so the three books that we have over there are one is Best of the Black Pot, which is just a collection of what, some of my dad's favorite recipes. From the blog. From the blog, yes. The second book is Black Pot, Black, I can't talk today, Black Pot for Beginners, which is, it's like a, how many chapters? Uh, I think it's ten. It's a ten chapter lesson plan on how to do these, <laughs> the basic Dutch yeah, so oven it, cooking. It, each, each one, each chapter is written as a, as a lesson that kind of teaches a concept in Dutch oven cooking. And each so, chapter comes with a couple so, recipes. And... So if you start at the beginning and go all the way through it, or you can pick and choose what you want to do, but if you start at the beginning and go all the way through it, by the time you're done, then you've got quite a lot of Dutch Ooh. oven skills. And the last one is Dutch ovening around the world. And it's a whole bunch of international dishes, a uh, little bit more experimental, um, a lot more, in my opinion, fun to do. But I like to do really weird things with food. Yeah. So. We like to kind of push what's traditional in the Dutch oven and push it, to, you know, like a, done in uh, an Indian chicken tikka masala and chicken sog and um india as in like the country of india yeah like the, the country of, yeah like east india um there's a russian dish called a kulibiak which is a, a pasta shell around a rice and salmon and tomato filling it's really good um greek baklava and uh, everybody better have tried the, the, the domades, the Greek rolled up grape leaves. I've done that. Crepes, or not crepes, uh, creme crepes. Brulee. Creme brulee, yes. I, I've done a creme brulee in a Dutch oven. That was, that's one of his proud achievements was the, the creme brulee in the Dutch oven, complete with the torch. Yes, I actually let him play with the torch. And we still have a house. And a torch. <laughs> and the torch, yes. <laughs> Do you ever use the liner? Yes. Okay, so on the recipe, it says such that such a Dutch oven empty. Let it keep empty. I'm basically preheating the Dutch oven. But it says empty. In other words, I don't have the food oh, in it. Oh, I get it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So I, so you notice I put the coals on it with the Dutch oven just sitting there. And I was preheating it because what happens is, and I'm actually glad you brought this up. What happens is with, um, especially with, uh, uh, well, it's true even with yeast breads, but especially with um, quick breads that are using chemical leavens like baking sodas and baking powders, is it requires that first impact of heat to get the uh, the spring to to get poofy. And if it heats up gradually, it doesn't get nearly as, it doesn't rise up nearly as, as much. Do you ever use the liners, like for that bread? You mean the, like the foil liners? The Dutch oven liners? I have used them. Um, I honestly wasn't impressed. Other people love them. Um, they say that it, lessens your cleanup time, but I really don't feel like my cleanup time is really all that much anyway. Um, it is another barrier in between the coals to the Dutch oven, to the liner, to my food. And so I don't get as much direct contact heat. Some people say, wow, it saves on cleanup time or it's easy to lift things out. Yeah, that's true, but I don't really find that it's all that difficult without them. Okay. So when you do like cobblers or cherry pie or something like that, you don't put it, you just are doing that directly in your... Yeah, I don't use aluminum foil or the liners. And when I do cobblers and things like that, I usually just serve it straight from the Dutch oven and 
and it's usually gone before. <laughs> Especially at scout camps. Yeah. Okay. Mark, did you have any oil in that pan before you put the bread in? Um, there was some that I had coated, but it was from primarily just like from the previous time I'd used it. Okay. So there was some coating in there. And that's actually one kind of cool thing too, by the way, is baking breads when you do coat that with the oil because um, you're not dealing with liquid contact. Baking breads actually really enhances your patina. Oh. Um, yeah, why don't you zest the onion, uh, zest the, the lemon. No, I was just thinking, just zest it right over the. <laughs> Yeah, quite a lot in there, so maybe make sure you take the stick across. <laughs> so we've got some. Oh, and here's the juicer for the lemon, too. I usually don't like unitaskers, but this one is just so cool. <laughs> Somebody once asked me uh, in an interview what was the one tool other than my Dutch ovens that I used the most, that I really liked the most. And I told them without even thinking it was my set of chef's knives. And actually, the nicer one that I have is about this long, and I didn't bring it today. I like I, this one better. Because I chopped the veggies up last night to kind of save time. But a really good chef's knife makes a huge difference. And I learned how to use it on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> YouTube Google. And I only lost one finger. <laughs> Why are you putting the lemon in there? I'm just kind of curious. I've never seen oh, lemon putting. Oh, chili with it's lemon just, is great. It oh, have, yeah. I found that, it yes, it. personally, in my own experiments, I found that lemon is more for savory things like chili and stuff. And lime is actually more for, like, desserts. Yeah, I love the, the flavor of lemon juice and chili. It livens it up. We'll probably only, well, I don't know, we've got a lot of chili in there, so we may actually end up using both lemons. I'm going to. Typically, with with a, a family sized pot of chili, I'll use one one whole lemon. Now we do get to sample this. Oh, of course. I'm just hoping it cooks quick enough because you know we're kind of running out of time on our demonstration here, and I I want it to be fully done so that we can all enjoy it. Dad, I thought we were gonna get. It. No, 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 no. The cooks are the last to eat. I know, but <laughs> if, if we're the only ones eating, then we can be last. <laughs> oh, crumb, we forgot. Did, oh, you did you put that's, this in? That's oh, good. <laughs> okay, Dad. You ever, like, work on your car, and you get it all put back together, and you're really proud of it, and then you know, it's a little screw or two, mm -hmm. and a little part, and you go, oh, no. <laughs> that's what just happened. <laughs> I thought I forgot the cream of tartar, but someone was smart and remembered to look at the recipe and put it in. This is why I have a sous chef. <laughs> oh, today? For today's Excuse chili? me, sous chef. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Chef. Sorry, Jake. Um, yeah. What I've done here in the in the uh, the chili recipe, what I've put in, in in terms of the flavoring from the spices, we've got the garlic. We're going to put in some jalapenos here pretty quick. Um, we're going to put in some fresh cilantro, and I always do that close to the end. Cilantro and lemon together are <clears throat> incredible. Salt, pepper. Um, I, love it when I, I couldn't find any cumin. 
I scoured my house looking for a cumin and I couldn't find it and I was frustrated. I don't know where some is. Where? It's on the underneath the spice rack. The spice cabinet. Are you sure? I looked there. I'm positive. I used it just yesterday. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I did also spice. bring some molasses too. Why? Molasses adds depth and richness. Mm -hmm. How much molasses do you put in the... Uh... Oh, you know about that much. <laughs> uh, for a family size, this is much more than a family size portion, but for a family size... That depends cooking. on how many you have to cook. Okay, go, ahead, go for it. Um, I'll probably put in like two tablespoons worth. One or two tablespoons worth. Uh, do one of them. When when I do when I do jalapenos, I I do it a little more gradually because you can't take heat out, right? So I'll put it in, let it simmer for ten or fifteen minutes, taste it, put more in, let it simmer, and and, and see what we've got because it can it can be kind of dangerous. To, oh yeah, mince them. That's another thing is I don't like to to be eating a lot and suddenly get one big bite of a huge chunk of jalapeno. I do. <laughs> I like I like it to be more evenly distributed throughout. When you've soaked your beans and stuff, you know, you do that right. advance, how long will they stay good in your fridge? I don't know, honestly. Because I always just soak them overnight and use them the next day. I would imagine maybe okay. two days, a week. After you soak them, you can throw them in the freezer and they last... Yeah. Really? Yeah, you just bag them and put them in the freezer in whatever size of a bag you want, and then you just thaw them out. And yeah, really. Yeah, so it works great. For the the recording there, the the answer is freeze them, put them in a bag and freeze them. <laughs> Grab me that little thing over there. Yeah. I'm gonna put this lid back on so that we. Now, I check my bread's done this with the thermometer because it's the only way I can found that I can be consistent. Uh, just saying, cook it for so long with so many coals. There's so many variables in outdoor cooking. I just can't rely on it. Oh, that's already starting to look great. Yeah, it's looking pretty good already. Not big enough, though. Well, we'll all eat a little piece of it. Uh huh. On a cobbler, do you have to let it cool a little bit before you take it out? I always do. Not much, but I always do. Because I took some of my out. I actually put only about half of that in there. I'm sorry. What? I said the spot I took it out. I just, you know, see if it was done. I just took some out. And that part kind of burned on the bottom. Uh huh. Hmm. It could be. Um, <laughs> dig do a couple of deep stirs there too. That's yeah, starting to look good. Looking amazing. We had the corn feeling now. Picking it up. What time is it? Anybody got it? Ten eleven. Ten. So it's after ten. Ten after ten. Um, yeah, let's... Does it ever boil? Um, it can. I'm, yeah. I'm a little nervous about those beans being cooked. I'm going to go off mic for just a moment. Well, Mark's finishing up and kind of testing. I'm going to close this out here so you don't have to hear me at the end. Um, the order form, I don't, don't save me. The order form, um, uh, will come out in about a week. I'm just kind of, I'm waiting for some prices on a few other things. So it'll be out in a week. I'll email it out and then it will be on the website. Um, the goal zero order is due Tuesday. So if you haven't got those in, get that in. And if you haven't seen the, um, the two videos that we did for Goal Zero products, they're pretty cool and pretty informative, so check out the website for those also. Hey, Sherry, uh -huh. who do we make the checks payable to? 
for for the goal zero to your emergency prep director. Okay. Okay. What's that? What's the reward? The order form for goal zero is on. Let me tell you about the new website. I switched websites because Lambton Farms was basically boring me to death. And so I switched websites to caffeinatedpreparedness.com. I know, hardest name ever. So um, if you go there, if you look under the River Ridge tab, there's a current classes page, there's a current order form page. There's a, so you'll find everything you need there. And then instead of emailing you all the time with little tidbits of information, I'll just blog about it. And so if you just keep on top of that, you can just follow the blog. Are we doing something from here? So which form is the sun oven? The sun, so this month's order form will have Mark's three books on it. It will have the sun oven on it. And also another little stove, a quick stove that's a great little backpacking 72-hour stove. So, and I'll have that out. Oh, probably after I get done with Goal Zero, I'll try to close down Goal Zero. So probably I would say next Sunday I'll have the order form with his stuff on it there. Um, and that's about it. We are done with classes until the very end of August. So we're taking the summer off. And while I'm up here, I just want to thank Mark for coming and his sons for coming. They have been amazing. What temperature is your bread? Because that's right now it's at about 200. And that's about what you wanted. At. Well, I like it more like 160 to 180. Oh, okay. So about the hot fast. But yep. thanks for coming too. Unfortunately, <laughs> the beans aren't quite done yet. So if anybody would like to stick around and field more questions or or whatever, um, probably yeah. for about another 15 minutes or so, then I, I think the beans will be ready. Mark, what do you do with the ashes when you're done? What do you do with all that? Are they good in gardens? I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I always just um, let the coals burn out in my metal pan here, my metal bucket. Um, if I have to take them somewhere like today, to take them home, I'll douse them with water, put them out, and then I just throw them away. Never throw away hot coals, by the way. Never throw them in the garbage can you're asking for a fire. I don't know. That would be good to look into, whether or not they're good for for uh, garden I, I, fertilizer. Brett, do you know? Coal ashes aren't really good for, it's not wood, a, it's not wood ash, not wood ash no. so they don't recommend you put it in the garden. I yeah, I know there's a lot of chemicals that go into making charcoal briquettes, too, so I imagine that plays into yeah. Not that as well. Lighter fluid too. What? If you've got the lighter fluid on it, too. Yeah. Like so who knows what kind of mutant veggies you grow? <laughs> I can prove it. I don't know. <laughs> Monsanto, look out. <laughs> like I said, this is my favorite knife, so I'm glad you brought this one. Hey, Mark, yeah. if, if you have a minute, will you just go over from just briefly how to season it again from okay, step sure. one to step two? A review of seasoning the yes. Dutch oven. Um, so the first thing you'll do, I'm, I'm going to pretend that you've acquired one that's all rusty because that's kind of the, the typical one since most of the ones that you buy in the store are pre-seasoned now. Um, in which case, you'd get a, a metal... Um, scraper. I like the ones that are wider than the, than the, the small fine grain Brillo pad things, but a metal one. So can you use an SOS pad? Mm -hmm, okay. Still and at that point, it doesn't matter what chemicals or detergent you use on it because you're taking it all off anyway, right? Yes. And just scrape and scrape and scrape until you get as much of that rust and old patina off as you can. And you know, you'll get it down to nice, shiny cast iron. And then um, put that in a 400-degree oven or in a gas grill that's fired up nice and hot. Heat it up for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, pull it out and coat it with some kind of oil. Uh, again, I traditionally, when I'm doing a first seasoning, I'll traditionally use Crisco because it's nice and easy to apply. 
Do you just use a paper towel to wipe it on? Okay. Be careful, though. Make sure you still got gloves on because the oil will get very hot very quickly and it soaks through the paper towel and it singes your fingers. Not that I would ever know that from experience or anything. <laughs> so keep your gloves on when you're doing that. And um, then and actually give it a good thorough coating so it's like dripping. Put that back in the oven. And that's why I do it outside in the gas grill most of the time because then it starts getting really smoky. Um, put it back in the grill or back in the oven and um, bake it for about 20 minutes. Pull it out, repeat the process. Total of two or three times and that'll get you a nice black coating. If it's not black, if it's kind of more dark amber, that means it wasn't hot enough because it didn't fully carbonize. Do you let it cool off after the first time or the second time? Do you no, just keep doing it? just keep doing it. While it's hot? Yep. And then, of course, let it cool and dry. Let me check on our chili again. A great organization of Dutch oven enthusiasts called the International Dutch Oven Society. IDOS. IDOS. I'm a member. Um, in fact, I'm a member of the board. And we've got a couple of uh, newsletters that you can just sort of pass around and look at. I brought extras. I only have three, actually, but they're my extras. And if somebody wants to take it home, they're welcome to it. Um, they sponsor an annual, well, actually, they sponsor cook-offs all over and an annual world championship cook-off every spring at the Sportsman's Expo in Sandy. I know I have never won. I don't actually compete well. <laughs> Brendan loves to watch Chopped and Iron Chef and I always choke when I compete. I'd much rather blog. <laughs> So when you put the molasses in, oh, we can do that now. Thank you for reminding me. Otherwise, what? I would have forgotten that. That's, That's right. Yeah. Why didn't you put it in at the first? Because I forgot. Oh. <laughs> Most of the flavorings I do toward the end. You know, get all the veggies cooking, get all that stuff going, and then do all of the seasoning and flavoring toward the end, because then I can. Adjust it a little easier, I think. Oops, sorry. Put it on there and realize the other one's on there. This seems like full. Yeah. So, hope you guys are hungry. Oh, yeah. I'm just hoping those beans cook well enough. Quick enough. Come on. <laughs> I'm trying to get a bean out like this, and it's just like scooting across the entire top of the thing. Hand me that uh, table food, Dad. The table food. <laughs> There's a swamp. I did save some for garbage. Oh, okay. See, there's a whole big swamp, you know, whole. Yeah, so. That is. There's the list. Well, they're, cut, they're okay, but they're kind of crunchy. Not what I really like. So, if people don't mind some crunchy beans, we can start sharing now. But why don't we start cutting up the bread and start sharing that now? Yeah. Hey, excuse me, Mark. Uh huh. Do you ever use one of these like little grills on top of <coughs> your? I coals? wish I owned one. That's really cool. I want one of those really bad. I saw that and I thought, oh yes, I want one. Wouldn't that be a good emergency preparedness thing? It would be very good because <coughs> there's some things that it's kind of cool to grill. Um, because of the heavy lid on a Dutch oven. As I said before, it traps the moisture, but there are sometimes you want a dry heat. 
and there are a couple like if you're like if you're grilling something, if you're doing a like a teriyaki chicken, sometimes it's cool to get that at a dry heat so it glazes on instead of just sort of melts on, right? What is your and, table called with the lights? The one that you're it's just a Dutch oven table. Okay. It's made by Camp Chef. But in those cases, yes, that little somebody makes a uh, like a little grill that you put right on top of your Dutch oven. So you got the coals heating the Dutch oven and then heats up your little grill. So how many people want some bread? <laughs> Everyone? Yeah, sure. Hey, Mark, will you go into how you clean your ovens? <laughs> Good point, because I never actually finished that last time. When I do this on my back porch, I, as I said before, I just spray it out in my kitchen sink and scrape it out and then once that's dry and I use very hot water and um, yeah. and uh, and then at the very last I'll do a very very thin layer of oil when I'm camping which is not very often honestly I um, Put it back on some coals with some water in it, get the water really hot, and then use that to swish it around to rinse it out and to get the the, the clingy parts of the of the remaining food out. Again, use a a um, plastic bristle brush. Plastic. <coughs> yeah, plastic bristle brush, not metal. Yeah, I would use a plastic one. You can get plastic paint scraper. In fact, I have those little plastic squares um, that kind of have an edge on them. You can scrape a lot of those those kind of things off. What can you tell us oh, about the volcanoes? Really bad. You guys don't want any. What can you tell us about the volcanoes? Do you use a volcano ever? I have not. I've wanted to. In fact, I was was it you I was talking to about the volcano? Um, I want to try one really bad because um, the way they're designed, um, they they don't let a lot of heat escape off the sides, and so you can actually get them a lot hotter. So I've heard. And as I was mentioning to somebody else earlier, one of the problems is if you want to do uh, you want something to boil very quickly, or if you want to uh, do deep frying. deep frying, it's very difficult to get a a uh, duct oven hot enough to deep fry. So I want to uh, try a, a volcano to see if it can get it that hot. But that's what I've heard, is that uh, you can do that with a volcano. Has anybody else had any experience with the volcanoes? We haven't used the whole whole lot yet, but you can get warmer. One of the reasons I'm not. You could probably just make little squares and put them on a plate. Ooh, that chili is warm. Do you preheat for cobblers as well? Sorry? Do you preheat for cobblers as well? I'm nervous to be a play on this. Cobblers I usually assemble in the pan and then put on the coals. Yeah, it looks like it might be as much as another 20 minutes before we really have the beans here. So, like I say, they're a little crunchy. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Tell us, about, tell us about your other two books that are coming out. Um, actually, there's only one more coming out, and that one's all about bread. Oh. Well, and I've been thinking about doing one on desserts. I haven't. I say yay. Go yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Always. My only problem with doing one on desserts is I'll have to do a lot more cooking and testing. I keep telling him to put more mess on scout camps. What would you what you do on a typical scout camp? But he doesn't like that idea. Oh, I think it's a good idea. And I'd have to actually go on a scout camp. How, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> how about, how yeah. Have you ever thought about doing something that incorporates most people's food storage? I have thought about that too. Um, 
And so that's another really good idea. On yeast breads, how do you do it different than what you did with the soda bread? Oh, it's a whole different animal. Okay. It's a whole different animal, and I love it so much more. I mean, I love a good soda bread, don't get me wrong, but... Do you let the yeast breads uh, rise in the pan before you cook? Um, yeah, I usually don't put them into the Dutch oven until, like... In fact, in most cases... Well, there's, there's a couple of different ways to do that. One is um, to... Uh, Mix it and then knead it and do the first rise just in a bowl. Then when you do your shaping, shape it in the Dutch oven. That's really good for braids or for um, uh, what, what they call boulet, which is a French word for basically for ball, like a harsh bread, which is how I actually do most of these. And then let it rise in the Dutch oven and then preheat the lid and okay. then put them together. Um, sometimes I have these little baskets, or actually had these little baskets, somehow they got missing, with cloth inside of them, and I kind of treated the cloth with uh, spray oil and, and um, flour, and so then I, I let the bread do the second rise in that, and preheat the entire Dutch oven. Okay, yeah, just put it on and start passing them around. And then, so put the coals underneath and on top and preheat the entire Dutch oven, which is really the better way to do it. And then just dump it in from the basket, slice the top really quick, put the lid back on really quick, and then let it bake from there. Yeah, there's all kinds of subtleties. And, and then my wife last Christmas bought me this long roaster, Dutch oven roaster. Ooh. And um, it's oblong like this, and finally I got to make an actual French bread loaf. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that turned out great. Where do you okay. store your Dutch oven? I actually stack them in the corner inside my house because I use them so much. Plus, they kind of give a, a rustic decor look there in the corner of the house. <laughs> and just pass it around. So some of these beautiful dishes here are actually made in the Dutch oven, like this gorgeous looking cake. Yeah, That's that amazing. was. Those are from this last. Those are the winning dishes from the last World Cookoff. Oh, for heaven's sake! That looks so good. Now, where yeah. can we get your books? Sorry. Where can we get your cookbooks? On the order form. On, On the, the order, order form, form. that. Mm -hmm. um, or anywhere you can get them anywhere, but. We have them for is it the yeah, one we'll that better prices than the one that you just sent out. Or? It's not out yet. Okay, so it's the one we watch for. Yeah, watch for it. Okay. That's coming. The book, the bread one is coming out in September. Okay. It's actually at the printers now. I might have to put that on like our September order form because <laughs> I don't. I'm thinking I already want that one. <laughs> so the problem I had is that there were a lot of. Dutch oven cookbooks that had bread huh? recipes in it, yeah, we had one and there were, but there weren't a lot of books that said how to cook bread in a Dutch oven, and so I had to do a lot of it by trial and error, and most of it, of course, was error. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. you know, like I said, I baked a lot of doorstops. <laughs> baked a lot of doorstops. And a lot of hockey pucks, and a lot of... And, um... Uh, 